Good morning. I kept trying to watch my watch, and all of a sudden I thought, it must be time. And as soon as I got here, Christine was finished. Christine, good to have you with us this morning. It is good to be back here. As I've said, I need to introduce myself again, I think, here. And I'm not sure I still remember how and what I'm supposed to be doing at this stage. Um, so thank you for allowing us to spend some time with our, our children. They're back in India now. And um, I'm trying to get back on track. I don't know some of you. I ended up. Part of the time when the kids were here, I got some kind of a virus. And I said, Ron drove down today, and I said, you know, it's just that cloudy kind of a day. I could have curled right up and taken a nap even yet. Today, I'm over the sore throat and the, the temps and the chills and things, but I'm still running on empty the way it feels. But it's good to be here with you today, and so glad that you are all here. So just keep me on track, all right? Because I probably need some help, and I need some reminders. So just keep me on track. Just um, as I look and um, visited a little bit with Deb, it looks like we are about $85 from our um, goal. And so we will have a special time later in the service where we will pass around our school bags again. Thank you, Audrey, for making those. The goal is 100, and last year we had over 100. So if we can top that 450, we'll have some other kinds of kits too. So we will be taking that special offering. Thanks for what has been contributed so far, and let's see if week three will put us over the top today with that. Bible study continues on Thursday mornings, and you've left Hebrew, you're now in the first Peter, is that what I see? So certainly feel free to come and join Bible study at 9.30 here. Um, Stephen was asking me, as far as I know, we are, well, I do know, we are definitely on for our um, all-church um, joint worship service between our four churches. That will be the last Sunday of this month on the 27th. We are hosting it, you are hosting it here in the park down by the swimming pool on um, the 27th of August. So we'll have worship at 10.30. Um, Roger has agreed to do music again. Diane, you were wondering, he is from the, the Kensal Church and is a former music teacher, so plays the guitar. And we just had a wonderful time singing last year, parts and harmony. So I said to Roger, let's think about what are some of those songs. And so if anybody's got some requests and some favorite songs, some harmony, let me know and we'll see what we can do. Because it was so fun last year, the singing that we did. Following that, then, we will have a, a picnic, and so um, Rick asked me to announce and ask if there are a couple people that would have grills. So do you want gas grills, charcoal, whatever, Rick? What are your thoughts? I would imagine gas would work best. Gas would be best. So the, um, this church is going to provide the meat for the picnic, and then we'll kind of do a planned potluck, or at least that's kind of what the thought is. And then following that, the joint staff parish team, so that'll be members of the staff parish from all four churches, will come back here and we will have a meeting. I think it'll be around one o'clock. I have my one-on-one -on -one tomorrow in Jamestown with our district superintendent, Kermit Culver, so I'll see Stephen if he can straighten me out and get me on track here with what we need to do for that meeting. I also, it's not in the bulletin, but I wanted to mention, um, I did go online and do a little checking, the movie All Saints, and it's just coming out, I think, uh, or August 25th. They're going to be showing it at the Bison Six Cinema in Jamestown. Uh, it's rated PG. It's based on the true story of a salesman um, turned pastor. Um, his name is, uh, it's paid, played by John Corbett. Um, and he comes to a tiny church with the instructions that he's to close that church down. And as I read and watch the trailer and things, it looks like there are a lot of refugees from Southeast Asia there. And together they risk everything to plant seeds for a future, it says, that just might save them all. So it really kind of fits with what we're talking about today as we are talking about the parable of the sower. So be watching for more details, but that um, begins August 25th up in um, Jamestown at the Bison Six Cinema. I think it would be an excellent film. I hope that I can get there to see that. Are there other announcements that we need to share? Rick. The food pantry is running really low on food for some reason. Summer is generally our slower month, where we build up our, our reserves, and we've been getting really hit hard. So I put the uh, shopping cart 
grocery cart in the, excuse me, North Entry. Okay. So if uh, you have anything that you want to bring, we greatly appreciate it. Right. Or when you're in the grocery store, pick up a couple extra items to bring to the, to no the. Ice cream. <laughs> Rick, do, does the food pantry have a refrigerator? I mean, are they able to? No. So it's no, just the, the staples, the canned yeah, goods. And the what we do is, is we give a, a voucher. We have two different vouchers, but the amounts all depend on the people, number of people in the family. Sure. And then they can go to the grocery store with that voucher, and then they can pick up milk, eggs, meat. What they need. Alcohol, then. The staples. They can't pick up tobacco products or. Uh, right. Right. Anyway, so they, there, there is provision for them to get those other the things. The things that they need that are that you can't keep in yeah, the food like I said, pantry. I, I had to go the other day and I opened up while I was waiting and, and it was uh, pretty bare. <laughs> Shelves are old, like Old Mother Hubbard's cupboard, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and this church has been really giving in the past, and I know they will be again, but we greatly appreciate it. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, and thank you for your generosity in the way that you give for that. Are there other announcements, things that we should be sharing? So, how about birthdays and anniversaries? Have we had some birthdays this last week, some anniversaries? Do we have some coming up this week? We've got, no? Well, again, welcome. I am so glad that you are here. Let us then continue as we prepare our hearts and come before God. Let us pray. God of abundant love, we come to you this day aware of growth and upcoming harvest in all aspects of our lives. Not only do we see growth in nature, and God, we marvel and we wonder how the crops can continue to even be putting on a seed in this time of dryness and drought. But God, we see that your miracle and the growth is there in nature. We see growth and change in our families, in our nation, in our world, in the various cultures and the societies of this world. And so, God, we come to you this day asking you to make us aware of the growth that happens all around us, of the potential for growth around us, and of that positive impact that we can have in supporting this growth for your kingdom and your will. So open our hearts, God, to receive all that you offer, that we may be your fruitful workers for you. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. As you are able, let us stand and join in our responsive call to worship. <clears throat> the Lord is the sower of the seeds of love and redemption. But we have not always been ready to receive these seeds. Today we hear again the scriptures that remind us of the awesome generosity of God. Help us to be good soil, O oh God, prepared to receive your love. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of praise then, <clears throat> I was there to hear your morning cry. It's in the um, Faith We Sing in our little black books, number 2051. The Faith We Sing, 2051. <laughs>
life that we are talking about as we sow the seeds and we grow. And so we know that it is by that personal contact, by that personal invitation, that people feel welcomed in a part of the church. So let's reach out, greet one another, make everyone feel a part of this family. to turn in your hymnals to 757. It's Psalm 25, the responsive reading there on um, 757. Let us stand as you are able. Find the page myself here. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Let none that wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are clothed with treachery. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore the Lord instructs sinners in the way, and leads the humble in what is right, and teaches them their way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep the Lord's covenant and testimonies. You may be seated.
Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. It is a familiar story that we have heard, um, this parable of the sower. What's interesting about this parable is that not only does Jesus tell the parable, but then there is a kind of an interlude of um, the purpose of the parables. And then um, continuing on in verse 18 then, he explains what that parable means. There's only a couple of places where the parables are actually explained. That one and then the very next parable right after that, the parable of the weeds among the wheat, um, that one is also explained too. I have to admit, I kind of like it when the parables are explained. I don't know about you, but sometimes I read a parable or I read a scripture passage and I come away more confused than when I began. And I think, how does that apply? What am I supposed to learn from that? So we will be reading about the, the parable itself and then what it means and then during the message, I wanna see if we can even take that a step further. So beginning then with the 13th um, chapter in Matthew, beginning with verse one. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables saying, listen, a sower went out to sow and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let everyone with ears listen. And then going on down then to the 18th verse. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, because endures, but only endures for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, this morning my husband brought me down and um, I got out and rather than come right up the steps here, I'm sure he wondered what in the heck I was doing because I was wandering around and I was looking for something for the children's sermon. I was actually looking for dandelions. It has been so dry that there aren't even dandelions or else, Rick, somebody's doing such a good job of spraying that we don't have dandelions. But it wasn't only in the churchyard. I looked, I wandered across back, let me get the right direction, this way, and crossed into the neighbor's. I just don't think even the dandelions are growing because I wanted to use dandelions for a children's sermon. And you know, I think that God loves the way kids behave when they have dandelions in their midst. How many of you guys have gone out and picked this handful, this midful of yellow, beautiful dandelion flowers and given to mom or grandma or a teacher? Have you done that, guys? Have you done that? I did, I remember. How many of you received those dandelions from your kids, from somebody? Such beautiful flowers they are in the eyes of the children. Little do they know that we consider them a weed. But then I think the other part is even more applicable to our um, story, to our scripture today. Because when those beautiful yellow flowers then turn to this pretty gray crown, 
you know, and kids, can't you just see them picking one after the other and blowing them away and those seeds just floating away? And I think God just smiles and God says, that's the message I want you to hear, kids. That's the message I want you to hear. And so even though in the parable, Jesus goes on and explains what the parable means, I think that perhaps there's even more to that parable. Even though he tells us the seeds that fall on the path just are not able to get any root at all, and the birds come and pick them up, and that's like Satan who comes and sweeps and gathers those seeds away so that they don't have any chance to take root. And then there are some who fall, that fall on the rocky path and there's very little soil. And just like a tree or a shrub that you will see growing out of the side of a mountain, or if there is a rock wall, don't ask me how, but there will be grass and trees that can grow out of that rock wall. They find enough soil there to grow. And I'm just amazed because when I think about how dry it's been, the dandelions aren't growing, but there are certain weeds, there are certain plants that must have roots that go down deep enough they're able to continue to grow. But because they don't have a lot of soil to get those roots down into, they are far more susceptible to the hot sun and to being withered and to turn brown and to being scorched when they don't have the soil they need for that seed to really take root. And then the one that I especially relate to, it said, is the seed, and I have to figure out which one that is. It's the seed that grows, that falls among the, the weeds and begins to grow. And then it's choked out by the weeds. And I think that so is applicable to us today in our world because I think about all the lures and all of the advertisements and all of the messages that we constantly receive, some of them so subconscious that we don't even know we're receiving them. But we're constantly bombarded through TV commercials, through the, um, you know, the advertisements that pop up on our cell phones or our iPads. We're constantly bombarded by this will make life better. This will be what will get you to look beautiful or that will make you rich. And so I think about all of the lure of this world that we live in that competes for our time, that tries to interfere with the values that God is teaching us with that still small voice of God that we hear. And so I guess I especially relate to that one. And then there is the, that seed that falls on the good soil that may produce a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, but it produces fruits for God's kingdom, for God's harvest. But like I said, there certainly is a message there and that's been explained, but I think that there's probably even more to that. As I said, how that young child just grabs one mature dandelion after another, and in that young child's eyes, the supply of dandelion seeds to be scattered is endless. You know, there's just such fun and such joy in grabbing that and blowing and watching those gray seeds flutter away. The supply is endless. And in fact, God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's ability to give second chances and third chances and a hundredth chances is endless. And so I think about the generosity of our God when I think about those dandelion seeds which seem to be endless. I can't even begin to comprehend the generosity of God, of the love that God has for us. And then it even boggles my mind even more when I think that God willingly sent Jesus to this earth knowing what lay ahead for him, that Jesus would lay down his life for you and for me so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could have a direct relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so I really struggle to wrap my head around that generosity, around the love 
that has no reserve, that continues to give and give and give from our loving Creator God. My best efforts to understand that, and maybe you've got some other ideas and I would welcome those ideas, for me is to think about those who serve in the military. Now, Ron served, he had a very low draft number. He was in the, the 70s, when, the early 70s when he came out of college, his draft number was 12. And so he didn't even look for a job because he knew Uncle Sam was waiting for him. But none of our kids have elected to be in the service. Ron served, but you know, as I think about that, I think about all of the men and women who serve for love of their country, who give so much. They give of their time, they give of their talent, they put their life on hold. And not only is it the, the person who's in the service that gives, but it's also their family that pays a price, that gives up something for them to be willing to serve for this nation. And I think about some pay a higher price than others. If they come back injured, if they've lost a limb, or if they come back with a traumatic brain injury, or if they come back with post-traumatic stress syndrome, or there are those families who have paid the ultimate price with a son or a daughter who has given their life and has not returned at all. And I think about that often, and I think about, could I be that generous? I didn't know Ron when he was serving in the military. And I think, how would I feel if one of our children had elected to serve in the military? And I am so grateful for those who do. And yet in my own heart, I struggle with that generosity of those people and say, could I be that generous? And so for me, I try to work and say, how does all this relate? How can I figure out and understand this? And I have to admit, it's hard for me to understand that generosity. And so if you've got some other ideas to help me understand that, to make it more real, I certainly am open to that. But to me, that's an example of extravagant love, of extravagant generosity that is lavishly given just as they, as God gives to us. And so God continues to shower his love, his blessings upon us generously and extravagantly without regard for the cost to our loving God. Secondly, when I think about children and blowing those dandelion seeds, I think that they have no regard for where those seeds go. They don't even think about them as a seed. They don't even think that wherever they land, there's a potential for a dandelion to grow and to come up there. They don't think that they might fall on the neighbor's you know, pristinely manicured yard where they, he or she has been out digging out each dandelion and each weed that comes on their hands and knees. Or they don't think that mom or dad have just been busy in the garden, you know, hoeing and getting out the weeds. They're just blowing those seeds and letting them go wherever they want. Perhaps some of them will fall onto the sidewalk, perhaps some of them into the driveway, perhaps right back into the grass where they picked them up. You know, but I believe that God is like the children with the dandelion as God sows his seeds of love and grace and healing. It's far different, I think, than the farmer today when I think about how carefully they have to watch that narrow, razor-thin profit margin that they have right now with the low price of crops and the high cost of putting the seed into the earth. I think about our son-in-law who, they live up towards the, actually up north of um, Grand Forks. And so they had that wet, wet fall. And they've had much more rain. When you look at the drought map of the state of North Dakota, they're one of those few places where they actually have some excess moisture. And I remember Greg saying this fall, I'm not even going to work the headlands. I'm not even going to plant any seed there. They are so compacted. They have been driven on so much. Nothing's going to grow there. And I can't even afford to put down the seed and the chemicals and the pesticides and the herbicides. 
I'm just gonna see if I can get a cover crop in there at some point to begin to loosen that soil up. And so he's very, very careful about where he plants because he knows the cost of putting that seed in the ground. Or I think about all the prairie potholes that we live with here. And some of them are dry right now, far drier than they've been for several years. And so some of the farmers have been able to bale around them places that they couldn't in the past. And yet I'm sure when they were dry this spring, they wondered, should I put crops? Should I put seed in there? Is it only gonna you know, um, drown out later on this year? Has water been sitting there so long that you know, the soil is soured and nothing will even grow? And so we think about, as those who plant and harvest, we think about the cost of production. And is it even worth putting seed there? And yet that's not true about our loving God. Our loving God, again, sows without reserve, letting the seeds fly, the seeds of love, the seeds of forgiveness, the seeds of second chances, the seeds of hope, God sows them generously, whether it's on the rocky soil, the soil with, that's been compacted, the soil that's rocky, the soil that has weeds. God sows without reserve, trusting that something will grow, excuse me, will grow there. And so I ask myself and I ask you, how many times have we missed an opportunity to introduce someone to Christ or to help disciple someone. Because if you're like me, I've already got this preconceived notion in my head. I think I know what's happened in their past, and I don't think there's much of a chance that what the seeds of love that I sow are going to take hold and they're going to grow there. How many times as a church have we failed to reach out and start a new ministry because we didn't understand the needs around us. Or perhaps we were afraid that we didn't have the financial or the human resources that might be required. How many times do we judge someone thinking it's hopeless to even invite them to worship because we think we know their lifestyle and why they might have made those what we consider to be destructive decisions? Or how many times have I failed to approach or speak to someone with a different culture or a different social upbringing than me because of what I have been told about that person or what I have been told about that culture without even getting to know them on a firsthand basis so I could make my own decision? You know, we've all heard, is it worth extending a hand up to that person that's sitting on the corner of the exit ramp at the interstate in Fargo. You know, we've been told that folks like that know how to work the system. And they're probably just going to take that money and use it for alcohol or drugs or something like that. But how do I know that? Perhaps that person has fallen on hard times. Maybe he or she was in a car accident and could not, didn't have insurance couldn't pay all the medical bills that mounted up and lost their home, and now they're homeless. Perhaps that person was one that served in the military, that came back with post-traumatic stress syndrome, that's not able to meet the challenges of this fast-paced world, not able to hold a job. Or maybe it's mental illness or depression it's pretty easy for you and me to make those snap judgments, but we really don't know the circumstances behind it. Or you think about the class bully. Why are they acting that way? Perhaps it's that cover up for the abuse that they are receiving at home, and that's the only way that they know how to cover it up and to act. And so I say, let us think more about the way that the children take those dandelion seeds and just blow them and let them land. Let us think more about the way our God sows without regard for reserve, without where they're thinking about where they're going to land, trusting that those seeds of hope and love and forgiveness 
and grace will take root. God shows us through this parable, God models for us how we need to be sowing our seeds. Sure, there's risk involved in casting the seed so widely and freely, but we have to trust the sower. We must trust in the generosity of God, in the goodness of God, our master sower. If we are too careful, too controlling, too fearful that we can't follow through of what might happen, we may lose something special coming from an unexpected source. It's not up to us to determine where the seed goes. The sower will take care of that. We just need to let go of our fears, of our own lack of generosity, and trust God to nourish the seeds and produce the fruit. Young kids are good at sowing dandelion seeds, but here's another thing I just want you to think about. Birds are good at sowing seeds too, especially those of the berries that they eat. You know, we may not even want to think that way, how those seeds are sown, but let us be realistic. Out of the excrement, out of something usually regarded with contempt, especially if it lands on us or we have to clean it up, we don't even want to think, but new life is sown and can bear much fruit. And that also is an example of the way our God uh, you know, looks at the sowing of seed. Out of things that we think are totally lost, that we don't even want to touch, to even attempt to walk into and clean up, God sows the seeds, and we know that new hope, new life, and reconciliation can grow. And the very last thing that I want to note about the children scattering those dandelion seeds is that they are joyful. They are having such a good time. They are laughing and just, you know, not giving, having a care in the world. They are living in the love that God provides each and every one of us. God joyfully scatters and broadcasts widely to the whole of creation. And God celebrates when one lost soul is found and reconciled to our loving God. You know, God gave us emotions but in, we hear that God says, be joyful as you give. We know that God is asking us to open our hands, to allow the love and the blessings that we have received so generously from God, to allow that love and those blessings to flow joyously, freely through and be scattered out, out of our hands, trusting that God will be the one who nourishes and brings the harvest. Yes, our God sows the seeds of love and grace and forgiveness and second chances without reserve. God sows generously, not worrying that there is a shortage of love to go around. God has plenty of that, and he doesn't think about what's in reserve. He never even thinks about the possibility of running out. And our God sows the seeds of love and grace and forgiveness and second chances without reservation or second thoughts on where that grace and love and forgiveness might land. Friends, let us follow the example of God, sowing the seeds of love and second chances without reserve. Amen. Our hymn of dedication, then, Wonderful Words of Life, found in your hymnal on page 600. Wonderful Words of Life, page 600. <laughs>
You'll notice then that we have decided to take a special offering for our school kits. So I'm going to have the ushers come forward and we pass around our two um, school kits that Audrey has made, our school bags. And let us give generously and let's put us over the top for this and um, see how many how many school kits we could actually make. So. Okay. <laughs> well, while we finish up that, um, we do have some things that we want to share um, today as we come to our sharing of joys and concerns. Um, you know, we had been reporting quite regularly on um, Sam Meidinger. Gosh, and it's been six months now. I think we were, um, Diane and I were talking if it was Friday or, or yesterday, um, came another Caring Bridge post from his mom. And they had been back, if you help me with that, and you printed it off, Diane, right? They had been back to um, the hospital, to the doctor in Minneapolis where the transplant was done for his six month checkup. And she is just celebrating the blessings. And as she said, and I got goosebumps as I read it too. She said it just gives her goosebumps to think how far Sam has come. He went out for a run the other day and said he felt like he could run four miles. Um, the engraftment is 100%. They're still waiting. Um, it's not quite making all the red blood cells as fast as they would like. There's a few more things that they want the numbers to come up, which they said it could take a year for that to happen. But right now they are just so excited and so blessed. Um, and so we celebrate with joy the miracle of new life that Sam Meidinger has received. We celebrate the person in Germany, the young woman who gave him that opportunity, um, the transplant and the technology that has allowed that, but most of all, the way God has worked that miracle. So if you would like to read about that, Diane has that. Um, so we definitely celebrate that. Diane said, I have this all ready to print, and then I had to move it from a concern to a praise and thanksgiving you see there for Sam Meidinger. Deb also tells me that um, Gloria's dad, Dave Ricard, um, is now on hospice, is that right? Gloria had sent you an email last night. And so Gloria is spending as much time as she can with her dad before um, school goes, you know, we start school and that happens again. So are there other um, joys, places you have felt God at work in your life where God has sowed the seeds and there has been fruit born? places where you know God is at work, or are there concerns that you want to add or more details to add to what we have here on our, yes? My oldest daughter is here, she'll be going back in a couple of days. And is she the one in, out west? Yeah, she's in Okay, all righty. So with the joy of having a family here, Zelda. Thank you for sharing. We are glad you are here too. And um, we will pray that, you know, for all of that, the technology, but that there's that miracle for you also, Zelda, that the plan works. So thank you for sharing that. Welcome, Donna. Glad you're here. <laughs> it is fun to have the kids home, isn't it? It is. 
Audrey. I'm just glad to be back at church again. Yes. <laughs> she told me she thought maybe somebody had taken her pew, and I said, I haven't been here. I wouldn't know. So I said, let's get reacquainted, Audrey, because I haven't been here either. So we are glad you are back also, Audrey, here. Are there other joys or concerns? Well, I want to share with you that the prayer that I am using today, the pastoral prayer, um, comes from Ministry Matters. It has a title of Prayer for One Voice. So let us take some time of silent prayer as we get in touch sometimes with those, those thoughts, those feelings that are buried deep within and as we listen for God's word. So let's take some time of silent prayer, then I will lead us in the pastoral prayer, and then we will pray together the Lord's Prayer. Let us come before God in silence to hear God's word for us. We bow before you, O God, in awe of your creation, its vastness and the miracles, the fruit that it produces staggers our imagination. Its beauty kindles our excitement, its mystery defies our understanding. As Jesus spoke to the crowds in Galilee in parables, sometimes you speak to us in parables. Your words are loud and powerful but their meaning is not always clear. Yet, God, we sense the handiwork of, your, of the heartbeat behind all of this. In Jesus, you have revealed your face, and we are delighted by what we see. We see power restrained by goodness. We see nature guided by humanity. We see purpose directed by love. We thank you, great communicator, for the revelation of yourself in Jesus. At first, we thank you for lowering yourself to our level. But as we look more closely at Jesus, we see that instead, you raised us up to your level. And so, God, we grow uncomfortable in your company sometimes. Our humanity continues to try to drag us down again to the level from which we ascended. Unlike Paul, we break under the weight of today's problems. We are constantly on the lookout for the quick fix. When our neighbor speaks to us harshly, we answer in kind without pausing to ask why. When given a chance to close a quick sale on dubious terms or given more change than we are owed, we promise that we'll be more ethical the next time. And when some foreign people opt for a system different from our own, we are quicker to denounce their choice than we are to study their history and get to know them. For this rush to judgment, O oh God, we ask for your forgiveness. We pray for the rebirth of patience that we might think beyond our present circumstances. Give us the grace to weigh our actions in light of their consequences on people in other lands on people yet unborn. And let us hope for a world that we cannot yet see, a world in which we are quick to bestow freedom as we are quick to claim it, and grant us the courage to labor for the world of our hopes. When we think of the degree to which our hope exceeds our grasp, we also remember the multitudes who cling to hope because hope is all that remains. We pray, O oh God, that you will move us to act in their behalf, that both we and they might obtain the liberty of the children of God. And so, holy God, you continue to provide for us generously and abundantly. We give you thanks for sowing your seeds of love, forgiveness, patience, and second chances upon us time and time and time again, day after day. 
We offer this prayer in gratefulness through the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our prayer response in his time, back in the faith we sing, number 2203. to remember in God's time God is at work making all things beautiful in God's time God generously sows and abundantly gives blessings to all God's children without judgment as the ushers wait upon us for the morning offering may we also give generously and abundantly without judgment trusting that God will multiply our gifts for God's kingdom here on this earth. Receive these gifts, O Lord. We give them with open hands, with no strings attached, trusting that you will multiply them and produce miracles with them in places and in times which we never thought possible. God, increase our faith as we watch you sow, nurture, and harvest abundantly. Amen. 
Let us then receive our blessing and benediction. God has placed the seeds of love and forgiveness in your heart. Go into God's world with joy, telling of the good news of God's abundant, lavish, generous love for all creation. Go to be a witness to all the miraculous possibilities for hope and peace. Amen. Our hymn of sending, Go Now in Peace, in the back of our hymnals. <laughs>